All right, so we're going to get started today. Um, thank you guys all for being here. We're going to uh, start with a basic lecture about photography. That's what, where we'll begin. And then today, um, we don't have as much demo as I typically would have, uh, because I'm really going to ask you to go out and, and shoot some actual pictures. Um, because whenever you do your own pictures, and then you learn to post process your own work, it's amazing how much you learn in the process. And I think it's important for you guys to, to work with your own pictures rather than just finding pictures online. Uh, we are going to spend during the exercise uh, a little bit of time finding a good composition to, to um, kind of identify what makes a good composition, et cetera. So you will be making a post today, even though the bulk of the work is, is outside uh, actually taking some pictures. So uh, to get started, I'm going to go ahead and share my uh, lecture here. So bear with me for just a second. Okay, so we're going to start with a basic introduction to photography. Now, some of this is going to seem like it's redundant or not new information, but I think it's good to have kind of a base fundamental place that we can all uh, start from. And so I'm going to go through these kind of basic fundamentals of photography. So bear with me a little bit. We'll start first with a definition of terms. And I think this is actually uh, a really important place to begin. Hold on, I need to adjust Zoom here for a second. Let's get that. Got to make sure all my recordings are, are working out for us here. All right, perfect. Uh, we're going to start with kind of this basic definition of terms. And uh, what, we'll, what we'll begin with is essentially that we have something that's called a camera body. And the camera body is a box that's light proof. It doesn't let light in unless you tell it to let light in. And inside of that box, it contains some kind of a light sensitive material. Now, back in the old days, that light sensitive material was an actual piece of film that you would expose to light. And, and in this day and age, it's all digital. So we're going to have some kind of a sensor that's light sensitive that's going to pick up that information once the shutter is open. So the, the photodiodes are that piece that, that um, is exposed to the light to create the picture to begin with. We also have something that's called aperture. And this is actually something that's very important in the world of photography. When you're uh, kind of a professional photographer, you spend a lot more time with aperture, but it even has trickled its way into our phones a bit. And I'll speak of that in a second. But what it is, is it's the circular opening in your lens that allows the light to come in. And that circular opening varies in size. It could be really small, or it could be really large. The larger that circular opening is, the more light that is let into that camera to be exposed to that photosensitive material. Um, that is directly related to something that's called depth of field. Now, depth of field is, is a critical component to good photography. It's something that good photographers know how to use and balance correctly. And what it is, is it's essentially part of the image that's in good focus and part of the image that's kind of blurred out in the background. And so it can be great as a compositional strategy to really identify what is important and critical in a particular image versus uh, what is less important or, or subordinate in a particular image. And this depth of field is related to the aperture of the camera. So the larger the aperture, so the more light that's led into the camera, the smaller the depth of field is gonna be. So the more blurry the background is gonna be. Now, I talk all about this depth of field and the relationship with aperture, and the funny thing about it is that it's more than just this and the, the relationship of aperture uh, to, your, to your camera now, because our phones now have the ability to kind of fake it, and they can do a really good job at doing that. So you guys have all kind of progressed through the era of phones, so you remember back to when we had a phone that had one little tiny camera on it, and that was it. Now we have phones that have multiple cameras and through software, companies are able to determine what part of an image is in focus, what's out of focus, and they can use those two or three cameras to kind of create an artificial depth of field in a particular image. So for example, in an iPhone, if you go into portrait mode, you're gonna create a depth of field 
but that depth of field is less related to the aperture of the camera and far more related to the po processing power of the phone and those three cameras that it's working with. So kind of big developments. Here's an example side by side of depth of field and where it might be appropriate. So on the left here, I have an f 1.8, which is a very large aperture, a lot of light coming into the camera. Um, and you can see I have the rest of the details here about that particular shot and very, very little of the actual um, of the actual flower petal is in focus. We could see just right down in there, a little bit is in focus, but everything beyond that plane right there is all blurry. So all the rest of it is blurry going toward the back of the photo and everything actually coming toward us in the front is also blurry. So that is a good example of using this depth of field. Now, if we jump over here into this photograph, we have the opposite effect. So down here, we have this, um, what's called an F8, which is a very small aperture. It's not, it's not that small, but relative to a 1.8, it's very small. And when we're taking that, the bulk of this image, all the way from the little ice plant here in the front, all the way to the back here, where we've got the little bit of the cliff on the hillside, all of that is in focus. So in this scenario, because we're taking a landscape photo, we don't want the background to be blurry or the foreground to be blurry. We want it all to be in focus. So this is an example of where we would want the opposite of a small depth of field. We want a large depth of field. And so if you're working with landscape photography where you're trying to get everything in focus, you want to do the opposite. Uh, and that's a really key component in the world of photography and making sure that you're thinking through it. Here's a good illustration that kind of pairs these pieces of information together. So at the bottom, we've got these various apertures and you can actually see visually what's going on in each one and how this little circle gets bigger in each piece. And as that opening in the camera's lens gets bigger, you can see that more and more of the image is actually uh, is out of focus. So in the first one where we have the small aperture, we can see almost from here all the way back to maybe about there, really easily and clearly. And as we increase, as we move this direction, you can see less and less of the image is actually in focus until we end up with very, very little of the image that's in focus. So it's a good illustration of what this depth of field can accomplish. So what I'm asking you to do in the world of photography is be conscious of these things. I'm not saying that you're gonna go out and buy a digital SLR camera and all, you're gonna become a professional photographer, but I want you to be aware of what these can do. Shutter speed is another primary factor that affects the overall exposure of a captured image. And it has to do with how long the light is allowed to hit a particular sensor or photosensitive material. It could be a piece of film uh, back in the old days. And it's measured in seconds although really it's usually maybe 125th of a second. So it's a really short period of time, short little clips. Now, why does this matter? Well, depending on the length of the shutter speed, the time that it takes the camera to come in and be exposed to light, we can freeze motion or we can blur motion. So I'm gonna use this example here. Um, that is a picture of a waterfall. And this first image, it's 1 50th of a second. And if we actually, if we sped it up, we'd probably get some more individual drops in the waterfall, but you can still see, like if you looked right in here, for example, you can still see some individual drops of water that are frozen in time because of this particular shutter speed. If we jump forward, we've, went, we, we've gone from 1 50th of a second, now we're at 1 10th of a second. And you can see if we look in the same spot, if we look right here, those individual drops that we had just seen are now starting to blur because we're capturing the motion. So in one tenth of a second, a drop has actually moved, I don't know, three centimeters, you know, an inch. Maybe it's moved a little bit more. That movement is captured in this motion blur. If we keep going, we can go up to a half second. You can see that if we look again in the same area that it's starting to get almost wispy because more and more of that waterfall is being captured as part of that motion blur. The other thing that you can start to see is if we look down here in the bottom of the pool, the individual little ripples, the waves that are in the pool are starting to smooth out. Let's go forward again. So this is one second. 
so that the waterfall in the same area is starting to get even lighter and wispier. And the ripples down here at the bottom are getting even smoother. So we're progressing our way through it. All right, here's another example of a side-by-side. -side. I think this one's a nice dramatic side-by-side uh, -side here where we've got the one 160th of a second and you're seeing all of those individual spray drops. When the, when the wave hits the, the tree on the beach, you get all those individual droplets of spray. If we change the exposure over here, uh, this is a big jump from one 60th, one 160th of a second all the way over to four seconds. That's a really big jump. And when we make that really big jump, you can see that everything is smoothed out. We're not seeing any foam in the water. We're definitely not seeing any spray coming off the tree, but we're barely even seeing the waves. The waves have all smoothed out in here too. So it's really changing what the image looks like based on just the variety of time that our exposure is allowed to, to um, hit the, the photosensitive material. ISO, which is also known as film speed, is kind of a weird holdback to the world of uh, like old film. And I guess the easiest way to describe it is you used to go to a store, and a lot of times it was like a drugstore. You'd go to your drugstore and you'd buy film. And now most of you probably can't remember doing this, but I do remember doing it. So you'd go to the drugstore, you'd buy film, and you'd have to pick what ISO rating your film was. And essentially what that is, is it's how sensitive is that material to light. So if you bought ISO 100, it wasn't that sensitive. If you bought ISO 800, it was really sensitive to light. And so you could vary that depending on how good of a photography you were to get better results. Now, ISO in the digital world is essentially doing the same thing. It's allowing us to control how sensitive that little sensor is inside your camera to light. Now, why is this important? Well, we can shoot in much lower light conditions when there's not as much light if we use a higher ISO. So we make the sensor more sensitive. We can shoot with less light and still get a nicely exposed image. The problem is that when we do this, especially with a lower quality camera, we end up with images like this. And some of you may have remembered taking images like this. This was very common early in uh, cell phone photos where we get all this noise, all these little pixels that aren't really good. Those pixels are because the camera cranked up its ISO to be really, really sensitive. And as a result, got a bunch of artifacts and bad information as part of the image. Now, as cameras have gotten better, we've been able to increase the ISO and still get really nice quality images. This one here is an ISO of 1600 and it has very, very little noise. Now I'd like to point out that this is a very good camera at the same time. So the bigger the sensor, the better quality the camera, the higher uh, sensitivity you can put on the sensor and still get a good image without a lot of artifacting. So that's the advantage of our new world cell phones where we can do this and be able to shoot in much lower light conditions without getting all the artifacts and baggage. Here's a side-by-side -side chart that helps kind of identify what's happening as we increase the sensitivity of these sensors or uh, the, the ISO. If we start at the first one, this is down here at ISO 100, you can see there's very little noise. But as we progress to the next, to the next, to the next, you can see that the, the amount of noise, especially in the tape measure, I think that's the easiest place to see it, really increases. So the more sensitive the material, the less you can really read or see uh, the quality of the image. Over here at ISO 100, we can actually read the words. Out here, we can barely, barely come through with the words. So that's a difference that happens depending on your ISO. White balance, and I'm sure you've experienced this before, uh, white balance applies only to digital cameras. And it's basically adjusting the amounts of color in the image so that you can tinge a neutral color one direction or another. And that makes a little, it's, it's easier to actually explain this in photographic form. So I'm gonna flip forward and then I'll flip back in a second. This is a great example of what white balance, when white balance gets off. So on the left side here, we have a white balance where the white, the true white color is turned a little bit blue. And on the right, we have the correct image. So it almost looks like maybe you're underwater in this image, 
uh, on the left because the white is tinted blue versus the white being pure white or even tinted a little bit on the orange scale. So we're controlling what that white or gray value really is. And that's the good news is that we can, we can always go back and adjust it after the fact. Photoshop is great at doing this. We can skew the colors uh, as necessary. But most cameras today don't have a lot of trouble with this. They have something called auto white balance where they can basically determine what white should be in a photo. And most of the time they're accurate. So you can go back and fix it, but most of the time they're accurate um, now. Bracketing. Bracketing is something that we do either when we're trying to make sure we don't mess up when we're shooting really manual photographs, or when we're trying to combine things together into a high dynamic range picture. We'll spend uh, another lecture, uh, it's gonna be 106, where we'll talk about high dynamic range uh, photography. So don't worry if, if this kind of glosses over at this point. But the idea here is that we're shooting a group of images rather than individual images. So if I went out and I wanted to shoot a single image, when I go to shoot that single image, I might accidentally underexpose it or overexpose it. And then theoretically the image is ruined. If however, I use bracketing as a technique, I would shoot three images, the middle one being quote, properly exposed. So it looks about right. And the other two would be one that's deliberately underexposed and one that's deliberately overexposed. And so I'm kind of covering myself and making sure that I, I expose this correctly. Now you're out there saying, why on earth would I spend all this extra effort to take these bracketed photos? Well, it's kind of like what the iPhone does with live photos, where they take the best photo, but they kind of pre-record a little bit of a short snippet of video so you could adjust what the actual image is. It's kind of protecting you. So where it really comes into to play, and this is actually something that you can do at home, if you look around the room that you're in right now, and my guess is that you probably have a window. So look in your room and identify what's the darkest place. It's probably like under your desk. And then look around and identify what the lightest place is. So in my case, it's looking out the window toward the sky. If I were to sit in the back corner of this room and try to take a picture that properly exposed the sky and also properly exposed the dark area under the table and everything in between, it would be really, really difficult. I could expose correctly for under the desk or I could expose for correctly for outside, but not both. And so this strategy allows us to ultimately uh, composite those three images together to get under the desk exposed correctly, the room exposed co correctly, and the sky exposed correctly. So we'll spend more time looking at this. Here's a couple examples of what high dynamic range images do. A perfect, perfect example that you've also probably experienced is if you've ever tried to take a picture of a sunset, and when you take a picture of a sunset, it never quite turns out exactly the way that you think it should. And that's because that they're either underexposed or overexposed. And really we need something a little bit more dynamic to be able to completely um, identify what this image would look like. This is another example here, uh, a little bit more of a cloudy day, but we're getting exposure of what's happening down here in the details of the bushes, the dark areas, but we're also getting proper exposure up here in the clouds of the sky and everything in between. So we'll, like I said, we'll spend a lot more time discussing this going forward. So don't worry if it didn't make too much sense. Aperture and shutter speed have an inverse relationship. So this is, should be relatively obvious. If you want to decrease the, the shutter speed, so if you want to take an image, uh, if, you want to, if you want to make an image, basically if you want, sorry, I'm not making sense right now. If you want to make the same image, and you want to change the shutter speed, you have to change, also change the aperture so that you get more light into the camera. So if you decrease the shutter speed, you make it shorter, you have to increase the aperture to get more light into the camera. And the opposite of true. If, if you want to um, make the shutter speed take longer, you have to decrease the aperture, make it smaller to let less light in the camera. And again, that's less important today because we don't shoot manual, we shoot more um, automatic. Exposure value, if you were a true manual photographer, if you were going out and you were uh, trying to shoot things full manual mode on like a digital SLR, um, you would use a chart like this, 
where you would say, okay, I'm out in uh, light sand or snow. It's slightly hazy. So my exposure value is 16. Then you'd move on to a chart like this and you'd say, okay, if my exposure value is 16 and I want to shoot with an aperture of say 16, I'd come down here and I'd come over here. My shutter speed should be one 250th of a second. And good manual photographers basically know this stuff. The great news is that we, especially with cell phones now, can shoot in manual mode and the cameras do this for us. So we don't have to spend that much time working through it. That was exposure value. We also have something called exposure compensation. And that's when you're taking a photo, but you know that what the camera is doing is a little bit too light or a little bit too dark. And so the easiest way of describing this is if you've worked on, uh, on your phone and you put your finger on the screen and you drag up or down while you're trying to take a picture and it will deliberately darken or lighten the screen or the, the image, that's what exposure compensation is doing. You're manually overriding the camera's automatic settings to get the exposure that you want. So the middle one was the standard exposure. We're increasing the exposure by compensating positive or decreasing the exposure by compensating negative. Again, that, that little drag on your camera is what's happening. So, uh, side note on lighting, and this is something that's actually uh, pretty important when you're thinking about taking photos, is that light during the day varies. No surprise. Noon is generally the most even light we can get. It's coming from uh, the, the, the sunlight is coming from high in the sky. It's coming straight down, and we're going to get very accurate color information. The opposite, if we look at uh, close to sunset, close to sunrise, the light is coming kind of sideways and it's gonna accentuate texture, but it isn't going to be as accurate from a color standpoint. So the best way of describing this is way back when I was in uh, school, I went on a, a field school uh, in Peru. And I'm actually gonna show a, an image of that a little bit later today. When we were there, it was a combination of architecture students and archaeology students that were, that were there. We were doing advanced digital site documentation of this particular site um, called Tambo, Colorado, which has, uh, it's in the desert in Peru, it's not in the highlands, and it has some of the most accurate, um, or it has some of the most well-preserved uh, paintings, Inca paintings on the walls. And so we were there kind of documenting the site and whatever. We were looking at the architecture, the archaeologists were looking at the paintings, et cetera. So when we would get there in the morning, the architects would go running around and take a bunch of pictures early in the day because that time of day kind of accentuated the walls and the, the, the shadows and, and what the buildings look like. And the archaeologists would sit around and have a cup of coffee and, and not get to work right away. And they would run around right at noon and try to take pictures because they were trying to accurately represent the colors on the walls and they didn't want all the shadows. And then a little bit later in the day, we'd come back out and take more images during kind of the sunset, um, high slanting light time, because that would again, accentuate the buildings and kind of the, the massing, et cetera. So it really depends on what your purpose is as to when you wanna go out and take photographs. So, Let's talk a little bit about the digital image file types. So we've talked a lot about the, the, the camera and the camera body and the, the definition of terms. Now let's move into what, uh, what about the file types. So the most common one by far is the JPEG. And you guys have all experienced this. It comes out of most everything. It's available everywhere. Um, it's highly compressed, which makes the file size smaller, which is great. The problem is that you can't go back and get resolution back. So once you've converted it to a JPEG and they've stripped it out, it's usually a 10 to one compression. Once they've stripped out information, you can't go back and add it back in. So that's a disadvantage, but that mean, also means that it's really small, relatively speaking. We also have a file type that's called a PNG. This portable network graphic is kind of a, a newer standard that we're gonna use a lot in this class. It allows for some lossless compression. So we're not gonna lose information out of our picture, but we do make it a little bit smaller. And the big part about this is that it supports transparency. So you can make the background of an image transparent or some piece of an image transparent, and it will maintain that transparency. If we had a JPEG, it would fill in that transparency with white. 
So in this scenario, it would maintain transparency, which is very, very useful as we create collage effects, et cetera. There's also a tag image file format, a TIFF. Um, this is kind of the big file. So if you're working to create a high dynamic range image and you want to save all the information, you end up saving it as a TIFF. They're usually really heavy and really big files. So they're not very common, but they are there and they are uh, available. Then we move into the raw file type. And so this is often called the digital negative. It's every piece of information that the camera captures all stored into one file. So it's generally much larger than other file types. So we've got two to six times larger than a JPEG, but it also allows a lot of post-processing flexibility. So if you realize you messed up and you, your exposure wasn't right, you can go back and you can actually fix a lot of things because you have all that information. And every camera manufacturer has a raw file type that contains this information. It just varies. The extension varies by manufacturer. So here's an example of a raw image. Um, actually, this one isn't, but I'll explain on the next slide what happens. So this is actually the left side is a JPEG file that when I took the photo, it was overexposed. Then I went into Photoshop and I tried to correct the exposure and it really didn't help much. I end up with the same kind of bad image. It just got a little bit darker. If however, the left image was a raw image. So it's the same image, but this time it's a raw image. When I go back in and do the post-processing, look at how much different it turns out. So I haven't lost all that information. So this light information here, because it's a raw file type, I can go back and post-process and I can get this out of it. So it's a really, it's a safe way of preserving your file. So if you can shoot in that kind of an, uh, a file type, all the better. Now in phones, uh, we kind of have adapted into whatever the defaults were. Originally, the defaults were always JPEG, so that's what we took. Now, Apple has their own file format. That file format is kind of a hybrid of a raw file format, but it allows some of this post-processing correction to happen. And so there's nothing wrong with using that as well. So I was going through my, my sample slides here, uh, going through the lecture, and I realized that these are so out of date that it's really funny. But I thought I'd leave them in just for the humor of it, but we won't spend too much time on this. Your camera, the truth is your camera is your phone because it's what's on you all the time. And the ca phone cameras have also gotten so sophisticated and so uh, powerful that now you can really get away with just using your phone. You don't need something more than that, taking images. So um, we have a, a chip that's sensitive to color. This is huge relative to what's in our phones, but you get the idea. And this is kind of the basic process. The image goes through the camera, hits the, the photosensitive material, gets transcribed into a digital signal, and then it gets stored. I love this. This was the, uh, the digital elf. This was so popular in about 2006. Um, this was the camera that everybody had. And well, now we use phones. So anyway, this was the digital SLR. Again, we use our phones. All of these modes have kind of combined into our phones and our phones now know what we're trying to do while we try to shoot so we don't have to actually pick those. Um, these kinds of questions also are starting to get outdated. How big is your memory card? Well, it's in your phone, so you have plenty of space. Plus, it's uploaded to the cloud, so, so what does that matter? And then the what to carry. So this one actually is still somewhat relevant. Uh, if you were going on an expedition for photography, you would have to think about what it is that you were going to bring uh, what kinds of uh, accessories might you want? Mostly you just need to bring your pocket um, because that's what's going to store your phone. It will always rain when you're trying to do things. So here's a perfect example of uh, we were at Machu Picchu and it was pouring rain. So we were trying to shoot images with tarps over our heads. Um, but that's just the way life happens. So let's talk through some basic compositional techniques uh, before we end with the lecture part today. And I think this is, if you take anything away from this lecture, this is really the important part of what we're trying to come across today. And that is to actively think about what our, um, basically what our, our, our way of organizing our thoughts is through the world of photography. So the first one is telling a story. So in this example of telling a story, um, we're gonna try to work through what the mood of the photograph would be um, and, and or we might work through 
a path that's in the photo or some way of, of navigating somebody through a particular scene. So here's an example. This was in St. Peter's in Italy. And it was about, you know, you're inside this religious space. And when you see the light streaming through the dust and coming down and illuminating people and the people congregating in that little bit of light, trying to capture that moment, that feeling of what it was like to be in that space. That's what this is oftentimes about. Another example of telling a story is where you leave some kind of an element in the image that causes the eye to wander through that particular image. Now, if I had to do this again, if I took this image again, I would have changed the cropping uh, because I don't like the fact that this is in the center, but it's a good example in that we have this little path that wanders right along this ridge and it keeps working its way all the way back through the photo and then ends up coming right along there and all the way around that corner. And so by, by having that path, we as the viewer of this photograph get invited into the photograph and end up working our way through the image and exploring it with our eyes. And so that can be a really powerful moment. Here's another example with, with a path, right? So this path is working its way here and kind of turns around the corner and ends up going around the tree. Now, it's also really nice because it's a strong diagonal and we've got a nice rule of thirds. We'll talk about those two in just a second. So it doesn't mean that you can't combine multiple um, rules, but this is a, a good example of that. Another example, this is up in the Andes Mountains in Peru with the light kind of coming through the clouds um, giving you that feeling of what it was like to be there. Next style or next compositional technique would be called symmetry. And this is where a strong symmetry dominates this, the particular photograph. So the other piece of this is that you want that strong symmetry, but you also want to concentrate on where is a point at which I can actually break the symmetry. And deliberately breaking the symmetry can really help. So here's an example of the Brooklyn Bridge. Uh, hopefully some of you have been there, you've walked across, it's a great thing to do in New York. Um, when I was walking across the Brooklyn Bridge, I shot this image that is symmetrical. So we're seeing the left half and the right half being roughly the same. But we also have all of the people, the active on the right side versus the left side of the pedestrian walkway. So being on the right side of the walkway allows right, this active flow and it and invites you into the image because there's something that's out of place. It gives you something to focus on and to look at. Next example here, uh, I have this abandoned uh, piece. I did not shoot this image. We've got the couch that's centered on the windows, but we've got a dust pile over on the corner here. And that really activates that piece of the image. Likewise, we've got the bricks up on the ceiling and those two, Groups of bricks can also really make a difference. Then we have a radial composition. And this is where we have a strong focal point at the center of the photograph and the elements radiate, radiate outward from that focal point. So here's an example of an ice cave in Switzerland. We've got a really strong tension between these two points right there. And all the rest of the photograph is circled or centered around that point right there. Another example here is we have a strong focal point right there and everything, all the lines radiate out from that point. And that creates a strong composition. I love this image. I wish I could take credit, but it's not, it's not my image, right? We've got a strong focal point right here. We've got everything radiating outward, which is beautiful. But then we also have these silhouettes which I think just activate the image in such a nice, positive way. It's kind of like breaking the symmetry. This is breaking the radial. We also have a diagonal, and this is where there's a strong diagonal element in a particular image. And that helps to frame the scene. This is actually on the DVC campus where we have those strong diagonals. Another example here with the strong diagonal, the train tracks. Overlapping layers, this is when you have multiple layers that are stacked on top of each other. Now this one, it would have been nice if there was a little bit more shadow. This is in that Tambo, Colorado, Peru, uh, the, the Incan city, where we've got the first layer. So it's this piece is in front of this piece, right? Which is in front of this wall. So we've got those, those three layers. 
So let's look at it this way. This is level one. This is level two. And this back here is level three. So we've got those overlapping layers as part of this scene. Um, just to step back, this is what the rest of the ruins look like. It just gives you a little bit more context on the, uh, the site that I was talking about earlier. I love this image as well. And this one with those overlapping layers, it's not, as, it's not as simple, but it's essentially, we've got phase one, which is the ground here. So this is level one. Then we've got this little piece right there. This is level two. Then we've got the pond. This would be level three. Then we've got this, this kind of beach and trees. This would be level four. We've got the field right here. This would be level five. We've got the water back here, this level six. And finally, we've got kind of the horizon that would be level seven. So we've got those overlapping layers that walk us back through the composition of this image. If you take nothing else away from this lecture today, that, uh, the thing that I want you to think about most is something that's called the rule of thirds. It's really one of the simplest rules to follow to get great images. And what, what you're gonna do is divide your camera's viewfinder into nine rectangles. Most cameras will do this for you. I know the iPhone does. And you're gonna position the focal points or interest on those intersections to create a strong composition. So here's an example of the Statue of Liberty in New York. Now, if we divide this up into thirds, we have the Statue of Liberty a third of the way over. And we also have the ground at about a third of the way up. And that creates a strong composition. Look at another one. Okay, here's an example of a rainstorm. The boat bow is about a third of the way over and it doesn't have to be exactly a third of the way, right? It's also about a third of the way up the page. And that again, creates a nice strong composition. If you're taking a picture of a person, this is also a great way of establishing composition for a person. So once again, the person is about a third of the way over and the eye line is about a third of the way down to create the image. Now you do have to pay attention to the context. So if I were to take the same image and I were to crop it this way, it still follows the rule of thirds. It's a third of the way over and the eye line is a third of the way down, but we're really missing the point because we're capturing a bunch of space here that's not relevant to the picture. We wanna look at what is he looking at? What's over here? That's the part that matters. So you don't wanna blindly follow the rule of thirds, but if you generally follow it and think about what somebody looking at in the image, what do you wanna frame that's part of this image? Where did you just go from? That's part of uh, establishing this rule of thirds. So this one could actually be a strong diagonal as well, but it is still a rule of thirds because it's about a third of the way over. Another example here, it's about a third of the way over. So this is a, a really good example of how do you photograph people? And the, the common thing and what most people would do, you hike to the top of the mountain, and you take a picture where you center the two people right in the middle of the frame. It really deactivates the photograph as a whole. Instead, if we flip the people over to be about a third of the way over, look at all the context that we've captured. So it's no longer, hey, here's a picture of two people. It's, hey, here's a picture of two people and look at what they just hiked to to get here. So we're telling a much bigger story and we're creating a much stronger composition. Right, this is up in Sea Ranch, just a uh, landscape shot. And we're using that same rule of thirds. The tree is about a third of the way over and we're establishing this, this cove with about with a third of the way up is the grass in the foreground and the, the line of the, the peninsula is about a third of the way down. Framing is another strategy, and that's where we're using something in the, in the first photograph to frame something behind it. So this is in Pompeii in Italy. We're framing the Bay of Naples using the window to frame the view. So there's our frame, and we're seeing through the frame to something else. 
Patterns and repetition can also be really fun because you're seeing something repeated over and over and over again. The key here is also how do you break that repetition? And so I absolutely love this image right here where we've got the, the, the hotel room balconies over and over and over. And how do you break that? Well, there's one swimsuit hanging on the image. Now, if this were me, I didn't take this image, I would have actually preferred to have this swimsuit right here because then that would fall on the rule of thirds. It would be there and it would be right there. And it would be a much stronger composition because you're getting both the pattern and repetition and the focal point ends up being on the rule of thirds. Another example of patterns and repetition, we're looking at this image that's, that's a colonnade where you've got re repetition going back and then you've got a blurred figure walking right through the middle. Another example, this is a very subtle one where you've got this pattern, this grid, and then you've got the snow kind of melting around it and that activates this particular image. Okay, so those are kind of the basics of photography. So what I'm gonna ask you to do, let me pull up our uh, exercise for today. If I can get out of my slides here. Cancel that, there we go. And let me pull up our work for today. So you guys all should have two things. One, you should have your, um, your mandatory check-in assignments. You should have an email with those. First starts today at nine. Then we will have um, the second sets all happening on Wednesday. And you should have gotten a, a notification that I posted under the announcements on the Canvas page, your two lectures for this week and your two exercises for this week. Um, the lectures obviously haven't been, the recordings haven't been posted. So here's today, for example, it's not yet available. I will link those up. I apologize about last week. Uh, I didn't get them up before I left to go out of town. So they're up now um, and I'll, I'll make sure that they're, they're there for your reference. Um, and I also pre-posted, if we go back here, I pre-posted 104. This will be what's happening on Wednesday. So obviously the lecture hasn't even happened yet. Uh, but there are links to the previous lectures. The exercises, right? We have 103, that's what today is. And we have 104. So for 103, first thing that you're gonna do is to find an image on the internet that you like, uh, and then write a brief paragraph, a brief summary of what makes the image good. What compositional strategies did they use? Did they tell a story? Did they use a rule of thirds, et cetera? You're gonna use one of those to kind of help uh, settle you into the compositional strategy. And then I'm gonna ask you to go out and take some photos. And these don't have to happen right now, just it would be great if they happened sometime before Wednesday, because that's where we're gonna deal with the first level of post-processing in Photoshop. So it'd be nice to have these photos available for that. So I'm asking you for five photographs of buildings, five images of people, try to include the whole person, not just the partial person. Uh, patterns and textures, five images, um, unexpected angles. That one's usually fun. People come up with great things for that. Four close-up images, one bracketed set of images, if you can do it. And it's harder and harder to do that. So I will give you samples when we get to that lecture. So if you can't accomplish this, it's okay. One handheld set of panorama images. Essentially, I don't want you to use the panorama mode on your, on your phone. I want you to take three or four images that overlap. So make sure they overlap by a bit because we'll work in Photoshop to kind of bring those together. Again, if your samples don't work, that's okay because I'll give you samples when we get to that part of the, the lecture just so that you can process that particular piece. I'd like you to take one self-portrait and then just go out and take another 25 images. We'll be working with these images uh, theoretically on Wednesday. So it'd be great if you could, uh, get those kind of ready to go prior to Wednesday. The other thing that was posted is your first assignment for the class, assignment 101. Uh, that is not due until Valentine's Day. So it's Monday the 14th. So we've, we're, it's, it's a ways out. Uh, and I really don't expect you to start working on this until we've completed uh, through exercise 106. So we've got a little bit of time before we get there um, and then You'll, you'll start working on it. But I want you to know that it's there. 
uh, and when the due dates are so you can kind of plan in advance for it. 